All right, hello everybody. As I as I said earlier, uh, today today's going to be all about you. I don't have I don't have any additional slides other than what we saw this morning. We can ask questions, but I also would like to kind of go around the around the room here and have each each country or each each group that is here talk a little bit about how you're using maps, how you would like to use maps, what is maybe preventing you from using them the way that you would like, uh, or just ask ask questions. So so we'll we'll be going around the room. So start thinking now about what you want to talk about or what you want to say. Um, and then we'll uh, yeah, and we'll we'll have uh, a little discussion with each group. So it'll be more of a more of a discussion session and more of a working session. Um, if you have if you have questions or if you want to try something together, we can do it on the screen as well. So if you want to test out some of the functionality that I showed this morning, um, if you have questions about anything or you want me to go a little bit deeper into what it actually means, we can do that together. Um, yeah, that's how we're going to start, uh, or that's how we're going to go go about this. But first, I want to to go to the slides that I had at the end of the last session. So in this case, we're looking at maps that were created by some of the participants in the, in the Maps Academy in South Africa um, earlier this year. And I want to go together and, and hopefully we have a, a mic that we can go around with uh, so that we can try to interpret these maps together. So I'm not going to tell you what these mean. There's some there's some text that kind of explains a little bit of it, but hopefully the map itself tells the story. And this is really important when you're using maps or designing any sort of data visualization is that it should be it should tell a story, right? And you can tell different stories depending on how you configure how you set up your visualization or your map. Um but if you do it well, it should tell you how uh yeah basically the what what you're trying to to learn from this this map so let's start with this one and uh i know i know that we we're a little shy on volunteers sometimes when uh, when i asked for a raise of hands earlier but uh don't be shy please does anyone want to take a first first attempt and we can work on it together to interpret what what is this saying so what what kind of what what story are we being told by this map here? Who wants to start? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, the legends ANC coverage, and actually the intensity of color shows like uh, how many coverage like we have in particular area. So I don't see the uh, labels of the area. So, uh, and this map is even not my country map. So yeah. this is only uh, what I uh, what I get is like it's showing the coverage. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's good. That's that's actually there are two layers here. If you see, there are actually two different. Or there are three, but there there are two different um, uh, legends down there. Um, and one of them, maybe it's hard to hard to read. It, it's actually written up here, though. So we have two different layers. One of them, as you mentioned, is ANC coverage. Um, the other one is women of childbearing age. So number of women of childbearing age. So those are related in some way, right? Um, so as you can see, it's actually described here as well. Um, the map is used to identify where the women of childbearing age are located. And then we can design interventions to target them using ANC uh, programs, for example. Um, and again, these were created by people from these countries. So they're, they, this is their take on, on how they would like to use maps and applications. There might be other ways to do this. This might not be the way that it would work in your country. But it can tell you, it can tell a little bit of a story. So you can see where kind of the, the, the targeted outreach for ANC coverage uh, uh, improvement would need to be uh, for this, this uh, country. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to Lesotho. Um, and we actually have an explanation that we can go to in a minute. Um, what is What story does this map tell you? And I'm, I'm also interpreting these with you. So uh, we'll, we'll try to hope we can get the, the story that was being told by the map authors, which was not me.
Sure. I think uh, the number of home deliveries, uh, actually this is the bubble map and it shows the, uh, the, uh, the number of deliveries. The larger the bubble and the color of, uh, you know, the intensity of uh, intensity of color is indicating that uh, uh, the number of deliveries like is more in the larger bubble. Yeah. 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 So there's a lot of home deliveries in this this area right here, um, but fewer in the other regions. Let's see what the, their explanation said and uh, see if other people can can help contribute to this as well. Oh, this is just a picture. Hopefully, yeah, there we go. Oh, sorry. Yeah, do you have a...
Okay, I don't know if you guys could hear hear that super well, but um, it's it's really interesting what you can do when you try to uh, look at a map and 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 understand what the data is actually telling you, what it actually means, right? So we could see in this example that there's a lot of home births in this in this hospital, but what they identified is if you look at the elevation, you could even use an elevation layer to to see that there's there's mountains and very very rough terrain nearby and very rural areas, and that is actually where the home births are happening. So people maybe don't have access to a, a health, health facility or the hospital where they're doing most of their uh, in in uh, staffed deliveries. Um, and so they're doing, uh, they, they have many more cases of home births in, in those cases. And so this might be a, a way to do outreach to those communities to wor work on access or work on uh, facilities that are available to, to communities in that area. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things that you can take, not just first seeing, yes, there are a bunch of home births there, but what does that actually mean and why, why, do, why is that happening? Okay, before we go on to, to go looking at some more of these, I do want to do the, um, the exercise of going around and, and every, every group uh, talking a little bit about how you're using maps today maybe how you would like to use maps and maybe any of the features you saw today or features that DHSU doesn't support that you think would make uh, make it be helpful in, in the programs that you're supporting. Uh, so maybe we can go around the room and start one table at a time and, and do that. Um, maybe start on this side since you were such a brave volunteer earlier. Thank you. <laughs> Oh sure, yeah. <laughs> I was I was giving you a break and and going around the other way, but that's all right. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, uh, should I explain what what we are doing in our country? Yeah, yeah. yeah if you want to introduce yourself quickly. Yeah, first, actually, yeah. um, we uh, me and John Zay, uh, like my fellow, we are uh, leading IDSR implementation in Pakistan and uh, also presenting National Institute of Health here. We are using maps and we we imported the shape files into DHAS2. And right now uh, we have a uh, uh, province level, district level, the C level and UC level boundaries available in DHAS2. And uh, we are also providing training to every province to have their own dashboards. And in the dashboards, like they are using maps to indicate uh, uh, diseases uh, and, and, and the intensity of disease in particular area. So that feature is well, and always they ask us like they want to click on uh, on the boundaries and they want to drill down within the maps, and that feature is not available in the DHAS two right now. 
click on the boundary and yeah. scroll down in the maps. Actually, they want like uh, uh, you can say if I'm uh, if I'm watching a district, and uh, and and the district is showing the number of diseases. Yes. Now I want to click on the on the map so that it can bring all the uh, the seals and the uses and the health facilities. Yeah, maybe they want to do a drill down uh, function within the yeah. That's how this is missing. Yeah. And um, the other thing which I saw right now, we can present two diseases at a time on the, on, on the map as well. Yeah. Go ahead. No, yeah. Uh, so does anyone have have comments on that or 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 suggestions? I think I th I think that feature might actually already exist. Uh, so I, I I believe that uh, we do have drill drill up and drill down functionality within the maps application. Um, I, so we we'd have to dive in a little bit more to see if it it matches your use case. But I'll I'll just show it quickly. Um, since we have it here, the the internet is a little bit slow. Apologies. Uh, maybe uh, we are using 2.36. 2.36. It should be there in 3.6 as well. Yeah, that's so we can... I don't think we have 3.6 on play, but I can I can spin I up. I think the events we can do, I think they're talking about the thematic layers. If they can click and drill down level below. Yeah. 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 In thematic layers, you can. Yeah. So we'll we'll try and try to do a quick demo of this. Um, so maybe maybe there's there's some additional complexity that that we could talk about, and there might be some things that we could improve. But if you right click here, you can actually drill down in the level. So you have left click and right click. If you click, you do the right click, so now I would like to see. I'm looking at the national level now. I would like to see all of the districts in this province, for example. So then you can go drill down one level, and it goes to that. Uh, that that province and you can see the districts within it and then you can go even further and go down to the the facility level um you can then go back up to the this level and then back up to the national level um so you you do have that capability it's maybe a little hidden because it's a it's a right click um but yeah hopefully that's uh, helpful it might be something so here we have this view profile capability maybe we would also be able to expose the um uh drill down and drill up functionality potentially from there as well. Yeah, great. More than one disease on a single map uh, should be able to have multiple layers. So you can do, let's say we want to do, this is A and C, um, just as an example, let's say we want to have HIV as well. I'm not sure this has, data. yes, this does have data. Um, so we can do a few different things here. So first of all, we can change the um, the colors so that it looks a little bit different, right? So let's change it to something something else entirely. Let's do this one. Um, and then we can also change the opacity. So in this case, we have two different layers, right? And so these are these are thematic layers, which doesn't do that much. Um, when you have them on top of each other. You can turn one off and then turn the other one off. So then you can turn them off on and off independently. So you can see them on the same map. You could also create an indicator that combined these two if they were related in some way. And then you could display that on the map. Um, if you have events, you can show both events together. Um, that, that could be done. Um, but I don't know if that answers your question in terms of showing two different uh, diseases or, or indicators on the same map. Yeah, yeah. You can control the transparency. The transparency doesn't help too much in this case because you you have two different values there. Um, you could also, I mean, the the main way that that I would recommend to do that is actually on the dashboard to have two separate maps, one with each, and then you can put them next to each other, um, because otherwise it's very difficult to to combine them, combine the data in the in the same visualization without being a little bit confusing. Um, there are some ways you could do it, but but it's it's a little bit challenging. Yeah. Okay, maybe we move on to the the next. Thank you very much for for sharing. Uh, maybe we move on to the next group. Uh, regarding the visualization by map, um, uh, the in the Nepal we are using 
the 2.30 uh, version so it is not updated uh, but um, whatever in the system we are using the uh, map is uh, we can but uh, in the lower level the uh, health worker cannot uh, be used because uh, some difficulties there it is more technical technical than um, uh, data visualizer and then pivot table so uh, we use in more in the central level okay yeah. By so, joining the different uh, indicator at time, yeah. yeah, we are using it. So, and you're in version two thirty, correct? Yeah, in Nepal. Uh, yeah. So the, so one of the... we don't have the uh, proper um, complete uh, geolocation of health facility, but you are using the uh, boundary only. Yeah. Yeah. So do you? Um, I mean, there's been many changes since version two thirty with the maps application. So I wonder if if something like this would be uh, accessible and usable enough for people at the facility level, or if yeah. it's it's still too challenging. I know GIS and maps, it's a it's a different kind of literacy that some people need to be trained on in order mm -hmm. to understand what the what this means. Um, but it can be a very valuable tool, especially at the at the facility or the local level for micro planning, for being able to reach out to uh, individual patients to see them on a map, for example, uh, or households or those types of things. Um, yeah, the, do you think the, that this would be moving in that direction, or is it still still too complicated or too challenging at the for for use at the facility level? Yeah, it is uh, it is difficult to uh, use. Uh, it we uh, doesn't have the practice of having a population of the settlement and the exact location of the health facility all over. Yeah. Uh, so we the uh, use it in the um, in lower level it is the. Um, uh, municipality level only, not in the ward level, and then ah, uh, community yeah. level due to some technicality. I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah we use it uh, for the micro level planning in the municipality level. Yeah, yeah. Thank so you. that's that actually brings up a good question for the whole group, um, which I I touched on briefly earlier today. Um, one of the challenges we see quite often is just uh, it's challenging to get accurate geographic information, right? So you need boundaries. You also need exact facility locations, and facilities are changing all the time. Some of them are are, are moving potentially. That can be a challenge, right? So, it, it, I think that maybe that's a part of the challenge that you mentioned is the facility locations are are not well known or not well not not in at least not available in DHS two. Um, so I wonder if there are other people who have have experienced those challenges, um, and maybe maybe can share some some ways that you've worked to address those. Um, but thank you very much for sharing. If you if you have thoughts on that topic specifically, feel free to share. Otherwise, we can move to the next group. Sorry. No, it's great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as during my presentation, I mentioned that uh, I'm working with malaria elimination programs, so I can say uh, something related to malaria elimination. Uh, actually, we just started using this DSI store information system, and uh, we started only uh, during this month, yeah. and uh, uh, it will be piloted for uh, uh, upcoming uh, December to December, and we have a dedicated MIS system for malaria, and we are using this for a long time. So from the next year, we'll be using this DSI store instead of the existing uh, MIS system, that is a cloud-based system. Yeah. And this is the mapping using this DSS2 is also still in the in the uh, uh, planning for the next year, not not now. Yeah. So, but uh, but it, it does not mean that we are not using mapping. Yeah. Uh, we are using mapping uh, specifically at the central level, mm -hmm. and uh, very recently during this 2023, we started mapping using the GIS mm -hmm. at the ground level. As you mentioned, that this is this is not also easy yes. because yes. Uh, there is a, a difficulty in getting the boundaries yeah. and the health facilities, the movement of the population. Yeah. As the country is now planning for elimination, so we need to have the detailed information at the ground yeah. from where we are getting the cases, whether it is from the at the community level or we are getting infection transmission at the forest level. So these are the things that has been incorporated in the GIS. And we have a dedicated uh, uh, organizations also, they are supporting us mm -hmm. uh, to uh, do this kind of mapping. And we started from the uh, highest malaria endemic areas. And uh, hopefully by, by 2024, we'll be able to complete the mapping of all 
uh, 13 districts, the malaria endemic districts. And maybe at the same time, as you are planning also to introduce DSS2 uh, uh, reporting system from 2024, uh, that can be this this uh, this uh, mapping system that you already presented can be also utilized. But at present, we are not using DSS2 for the mapping purpose. Mm. Thank you. Maybe we have also people from HIV. Yeah. He can <laughs> I just to to keep stay on stay on malaria very quickly. Um, I think malaria is a very very key use case for for GIS and for mapping, okay. as you as you've seen. Um, especially, I mean, you have you have spraying campaigns, for example, that you need to go and and visit households. You have uh, focus areas for for specific. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that I that I that I also missed yeah. because in the coming years uh, we are also going to include this uh, tracker ah, yes. uh, uh, for following up the case in investigations and the focus investigation and and also response yeah. that needs to be also uh, incorporated in the system as well as if possible to include in the in the mapping and uh, this mapping will will really help us uh, at different levels specifically at the central level. The managers at the central level can see the situation. The focus, the, what, which focus has, is going to be changed into the active to non-active, this kind of things, and from where we are getting the uh, malaria cases and uh, what actions has been taken in that area. Yeah. So this kind of information we are planning to include in the tracker as well as in the in the mapping. Yeah, so I just wanted to bring up this. This is this data is not very useful here exactly, but you have uh, malaria cases and you have uh, malaria foci for focus areas for for malaria, and you actually can have a relationship between those as well. So you have tracked entities for people that are, are cases of malaria, and you also have tracked entities for uh, focus areas, and you can keep uh, uh, yeah basically track the relationship and actually map that as well. So that can be quite quite a useful functionality that was actually introduced in a collaboration with with chai specifically for um, malaria campaigns um, so there's there's a lot of functionality there there's a lot more that we want to do as well we're continuing to work with with chai and other partners as well to to build out that functionality but yeah, we are also are closely doing? working with the mahidul export uh, yeah. uh, research unit yeah they are supporting us in doing this uh, gis mapping great thank you very much you said the hiv was another another thing that you wanted to discuss uh, uh, not too much actually all are says Moshbik Rahman sir in in the HIV program actually GIS is a great example in the data visualization especially uh, geographical location basis information uh, but in that time in our country especially HIV program uh, not very much used to as a mapping yeah. because of uh, field level stuff and program level stuff are not too much aware about the uh, mapping, but day by day, we will be used to the mapping and this is very important in our country, especially in HIV indicator. Uh, mm -hmm. So HIV, lot of, lots of indicator is the international indicator and this indicator show is a mapping, it will be very much uh, um, visualization to the, uh, all over the country. Yeah. So we hope actually, uh, in the coming year, we will be use the map is day by day increasing. This is from Mrs. HIV program. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions for this group? No. Okay. Thank you very much. We're gonna move on to the next uh, the next group. Don't everyone jump up at once. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for Bhutan, I think uh, we have been using this uh, map uh, for very simple purposes, like uh, mapping of uh, the indicator-based uh, <clears throat> things, like uh, in the cancer screening co uh, programs, we map the cancer screening coverage and uh, also the prevalence of uh, all this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also uh, map the uh, only for the indicator based uh, variables. Now, uh, due to the 
indexing problems, I guess. Uh, we have not been uh, able to use much uh, of the map uh, features. Uh, and uh, also, we have not uh, been able to subscribe for, for this uh, satellite imagery and uh, OSM. Uh, that's why uh, we have not been using it much. Yeah. But uh, we have been exporting this data, geolocation data, uh, based on the health facility, and then uh, using QGIS for map mapping purposes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's very... So you you were a participant at the, the 2019 uh, Mapping Academy, for example, in yes, Delhi. Yes, yes. Um, and I think the, the fact that you're using uh, in, in your country, in Bhutan, for the... Um, QGIS for a lot of the advanced analytics and, or even just analytics of, of maps is is quite uh, interesting. I wonder if you could talk a little bit for people who maybe don't know what QGIS is, um, kind of what what is it, what is it, how does it serve your purpose? Is it useful? What what can you do in QGIS maybe that you can't do in DHIS2 or that you're you're using it for today? Uh... Yeah, QGIS uh, actually is a very powerful mapping tool, uh, topological mapping tool, uh, and uh, it's also free. So uh, for the low resource setting, as well as developing countries, I think uh, QGIS is the best. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm not advertising for QGIS, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think this is the best uh, solution uh, for us uh, in the DHIS uh, mapping tool. I think uh, we have the features. Uh, I think uh, many of the simple mappings can be done in DHIS. And uh, uh, I'm very much sure that uh, we will be able to do much more in DHIS. But uh, for QGIS, since we have the geolocation data, as well as uh, when we need to add uh, more data from the survey and uh, also from the uh, interview-based uh, data collection uh, uh, data, and also some data from the other institutes and organizations like uh, climate data and all. Mm. Uh, we have been uh, using QGIS uh, for all other purposes, as well as equity profiling and uh, pluripleth maps. Mm. Uh, we have been using that. Uh, for malaria, I think we have uh, done a projection once uh, based on the data from DHIS as well as other uh, organization. So uh, all in all, I think uh, QGIS is a very powerful tool yeah. uh, that uh, everybody can use. And uh, there are so many uh, guides, uh, videos uh, on YouTube as well, which uh, we can easily learn. Yeah. And uh, thanks to, I think, uh, thanks to GIS Academy that uh, I was able to use all this uh, in, in my organization. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I think that's very that's very interesting. I mean, DHS2 mapping application has a lot of capabilities for displaying maps, for doing some analytics, for trying to in investigate the data, um, and to to make it actionable for for people maybe at a lower level. Um, but if you're trying to to do very advanced analytics or to calculate driving times or to to do all sorts of more advanced uh, uh, processing of the, of the data, maybe with other data sources, climate data, um, trying to do yeah, mapping with elevation data in in trying to figure out where steep slopes are for for landslides or uh, where where flooding might occur, those types of things. That's something that isn't supported uh, as, as a core feature of DHIS2, but you can take the data out of DHIS2 and put it into something like QGIS, which is free and open source, and lets you, uh, you need a bit more um, understanding of GIS to be able to use that tool. Uh, so it's probably not something that, that anybody would use at a facility level or a district level, potentially, but you can use that to really get some uh, insights into what's going on in your country. And then you can even import that back as an external layer or as, as uh, raw data into DHIS2 and make it available to the, the district level or the facility level where they're, they're able to interpret it using the maps application or the dashboard if they don't even need to go to the maps application. So I think it's a very interesting use case. Thank you for sharing. Any, any questions for, for the group from Bhutan? Thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you. So from Pakistan, uh, we are using uh, 2.40.1 version now mm. uh, for AIDS, TB, and malaria. Uh, yes, we do uh, using map. And we I have uh, showed the maps in my presentation earlier. 
we are using maps and uh, for data notification but yes we need to now uh, go on to the data triangulation also and data analysis uh, and uh, we felt a little bit uh, a difficulty earlier that uh, while uh, showing the data notification on the maps it has only three slots already available now i am seeing that there are a lot more than three slots uh, i mean data disaggregation levels in yeah. low high medium earlier it was three yeah. but now there are more than three so that we may be able to disaggregate data uh, more uh, sort of an a wider range uh, for data triangulation we feel uh, feeling a little bit problem to triangulate more than two indicators to be plotted uh, at the same time in an, any map and uh, uh, i think uh, we need to uh, to to uh, learn more from from the his pakistan team on that uh, yes for gis mapping we are using with the support of kit apcon team mm from the uh, from the netherland tropical institute of netherland and they are supporting us for gs hmm. mapping for the hotspot identification uh, for outreach activity for tb diagnosis and screening hmm. so, so we are and we are using those uh, gis uh, mapping uh, since uh, 2019 hmm. uh, now i think we can now convert those uh, those gis mapping onto the dhs too as well hmm. thank you thank you and i uh, i was speaking with adnan from his pakistan as well uh, earlier and uh, we were talking about i mean flooding is a is a big uh, issue in in pakistan specifically and knowing the location of your facilities and the the elevation where where water flows you can potentially have risk evaluation for facilities for for flood risk um as well as uh yeah as as well as trying to do some detection even if you bring in more real time climate data i think that's a, a very interesting area of exploration uh, he, he walks in as a, as i'm talking about him <laughs> uh but maybe you can talk a little bit more i don't know if you want to talk about the the potential for maps in uh, um in flood uh, risk mitigation or risk, risk mapping, Adnan? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, just talking to Austin about um, a possible uh, use case that we can use uh, because uh, if we see Pakistan, so it's uh, it starts from very high mountains and then it goes down all towards the uh, sea. So it, it has a very slopey kind of uh, uh, at altitude from top to bottom. And whenever the floods happen, uh, they usually happen because there's a lot of rainfall and glaciers melting on the top mountains. And then all the water comes down towards the plains and then it it, it flashes the whole country. So what we were discussing was that, I mean, with the extensions uh, provided by Google, uh, we can have these elevations uh, built into the map and we can uh, we can try and predict the way the flood is going to follow uh, because it will not be going towards the high elevation areas, but uh, it will be going towards the low elevation areas. And we can basically predict and see that where the flood water will go, which health facilities and which population uh, will be vulnerable. So this is something that we can um, do uh, by, uh, I mean, just configuring the DHIS to uh, and not using any external system. Yes, we can do many other, um, I would say, um, advanced thing, thing that can be uh, used uh, using DHS. So one of the use cases. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think um, I I don't know if you were you were thinking in QGIS terms as well how you how you would do that maybe because you have. You have river valleys, for example. You know the the vol if you know the volume of water, you can determine the risk level at different place. You import your facility le uh, locations from DHS two, then you can use G uh, QGIS basically to calculate a risk factor for each facility, and then you could import that back into DHS two, so you could actually visualize the risk, um, yeah, the flood flood risk of different facilities within within the system. 
So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of potential. There's many different use cases for um, GIS, uh, not just within DHS2, but but combined with some of the the additional tools that are out there as well. Very interesting. Okay, uh, yeah, move. Oh, yeah, go ahead. If any any comments or questions, feel free. No. Go ahead. Uh, would anyone else like to share? Yeah. I, I was just, it's just a comment maybe. And sure. uh, my, uh, our friend from Bhutan also sort of mentioned in terms of use of QGIS having more flexibility to depict multiple layers. Um, I was just thinking that you're, the example you presented there for ANC and HIV, let's say, having yes. color shading on the same administrative boundaries. Uh, and a very common thing which we at times uh, tend to see in 2D printed out things at times as well for uh, geographic mapping and depiction of indicators relates to one layer getting depicted through a color shading as the yeah. base layer. Yeah. And then maybe the under indicator of ANC1 coverage uh, reflected as a bar uh -huh. across another added layer. Yeah. Or maybe the density of a certain coverage through these sized uh, bubbles and that sort of thing. So maybe yes. that is something that could be considered within that uh, as a feature you did. Mention and touch a bit on that. Yeah, I will do it just now. Um, so this is actually something that is is supported here. That's a very good good point. I didn't come up with it when I was doing this before. But if we have another thematic layer, and we want to do HIV, for example. So my, uh, my suggestion was that both can then simultaneously be viewed by the user uh, and the, on the same same uh, display. Yes. So. So here in this case, yeah, right? Like for that. example, you can you can visualize two uh, two types of data in the same map. Um, in this case, maybe HIV and ANC, maybe they don't make sense. Maybe they do. I don't know. But um, yeah, in this case, you have the bubble map for uh, it might it might not make sense if you're trying to visualize two different types of normalized data because as we said before, no, uh, the normalized data or like per per capita or per per population. Uh, it's better to use the the chloropleth maps. Um, bubble maps are are a little bit better for for raw numbers. But if you needed to, you could you could visualize both in the same way. And there might be ways uh, that we could look into kind of layering of uh, it. It it gets a bit too complicated, unfortunately. So one of the you could do uh, like shading with different types of bars or something like that um, on top. But it, it it becomes quite difficult for for someone to interpret what that is. Um, so we try to keep things simple, but yes, there, that, that's a very good point. That it is, it is possible to do some of these uh, multiple types of, of visualizations on the same on the same map. Do we have uh, anyone else that would like to share? I see some groups in the back being quiet. It's okay. Volumes, anything? Uh, hello, so we are from Maldives. Um, so maybe this is not a problem with the Maps app, but it's a problem with how Maldives is. So um, in Maldives also, we have configured uh, the atoll layer as well as the island layer in DHIS2. But um, when we try to you know look into one particular uh, atoll and try to see the distribution of a particular thing, maybe like how many children are registered in immunization. Our islands are so tiny. <laughs> and in each atoll, we have so many like uh, uninhabited islands. Yeah. It's very difficult to see them in one. Uh -huh. It's very difficult to visualize them together. Yeah. Maybe this may be a problem with other small island states where only 16% of our islands are inhabited. Yeah. So that is a that is something that we are dealing with but usually if we just use the atoll layer it's a bit easier mm. but uh seeing all the islands in one map together because one them there is a huge uh distance between one island and the other island it's not so appealing or not so yeah. e easy for us to use so in yeah. instead of seeing it like this where where you have each each color right next to each other you have one spot here yeah. and one spot here and yeah. it's it's very hard and then maybe they you have yeah. to zoom out so much that they're very small so it's hard to yeah. see the color yeah. yeah yeah 
So there actually there could be an an interesting way to approach that, which would be, would be to use uh, the alternative alternate geometry feature. So you could actually create an alternate geometry for each of your um, physical atolls or or islands um, that is just a representation of where where that is. So it actually fills up the space of the uninhabited islands around it, so that it borders the other ones. So you could actually have something that looks like this. Each one of these might be a small island in reality, but it it gives you a way to visualize that information, and then you could use that in the in the visualization to actually display it. Um, so there, there's some in, some ways you could work around that, um, and I think there are some interesting things we could explore as well. Um, I could connect you with with our our analytics and maps team to to talk about some ways that we could support that. Thank Very, it, it, it's an interesting use case because I think it's something that a lot of a lot of people probably don't struggle with uh, in their countries. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm representing FHI 360. We have uh, a DHIS2 based system, aggregate system, which we are working across 40 countries, where we collect information for all the HIV interventions, including from outreach to care, all the cascade. So we use maps uh, to map at the country level, as well as at the district level. We have got data up to district level. So we actually map all of them uh, at the district level at various indicators, including case finding, then uh, uh, initiation on treatment and all that stuff. That's one part. Second part, we have a, uh, an issue with, again, somebody mentioned about point, co uh, point coordinates where uh, our facilities are scattered. So we are trying to import the uh, coordinates into the system and we are trying to map those uh, health facilities as well so that we will be able to show the health facilities performance as well uh, in the system. Along with that, we have around 18 countries where uh, uh, the trackers are being used, individual trackers are being used, where uh, you know, we have uh, data at facility level and we do hotspot mapping for identifying hotspots for key population. So while doing that, we use uh, uh, collect the coordinates and then those coordinates al also are mapped on the, on, on the geographies where uh, these are congregated, which is used for our micro planning. So this is extensively used in our area. So we want to do a little more uh, deeper into uh, the uh, org units because we are specific org units mm -hmm. uh, at our lower levels, like you know DICs, uh, that is drop-in centers, and then other uh, facilities which are operating specifically for key population. That we want to extend and uh, get it extended. So that's the that's what we are, our experience has been. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any any comments or questions on that? I think facility point locations is a is a big uh, topic area. I think we could we could spend quite a while on that. I'd be interested to to dive in a little bit more. Um, I wanted to show something um, as well, but so I'm gonna get that set up. But in the meantime, yeah. Any anyone else have have comments or or questions for this topic? other experiences they would like to share? I'm going to try and get up a, a screenshot that may or may not work. Um, so I did wanna mention some other um, mapping functionality that, that I think is worth, um, worth mentioning here as well. Uh, it's, it's taking a little bit of a turn from analytics to data entry, actually. Because as we mentioned, it's quite one of the one of the challenges. Many there are many challenges, of course, but one of the challenges is is having accurate location information for facilities, for events as well. Um, so that we actually have a feature in the Android Capture application to use geolocation to collect points. Right. So uh, currently on the web, uh, because you might not have a GPS on most laptops, for example, um, you don't have a an, an easy way to kind of say, I'm, I am here, this is where this event is taking place, uh, record that information. Um, but if you're, if you're on a mobile device and you're walking from house to house, for example, um, you, or you're driving between villages, you, you might wanna collect the location when you record an event. Uh, and so we do support that as, a, as data entry. So you, you actually say current location and it will give you the, the current location. 
um, and it will automatically fill that out based on your GPS. And just in the most recent version of DHS2, we added support for um, measuring and uh, and giving feedback on the, the the accuracy of the GPS location. So it will actually, previously it, uh, you, it would use the GPS location, but sometimes your GPS takes a long time to update and get you to the right location. And you're not really sure exactly where you are. So you just press okay. Uh, now it'll actually give you an information say how confident is the phone that you are in this place let's wait until we have at least maybe a 10 10 meter or 100 meter accuracy um, uh, level uh, before we hit submit and so it'll give you that feedback and then you can actually submit that and that gives you a very good way to collect um, event locations uh, when doing mobile data capture the other feature of mobile the mobile um, uh, data the android data capture app product is that uh, once you have that information, or if you have any ge ge geographic uh, points in, this, in the system, especially events, you can navigate to those places. So from your working list in the Android Capture app, where you have, these are the households that I need to visit today, if those have locations associated with them, you can click and open Google Maps and go directly to that place. And so that's something that was highly requested feature for doing campaigns on the ground to actually be able to uh, give, not just say, okay, I can look at a map and see where this is, but actually being able to say, this is the next patient or the next home that I need to visit today. I'm going to go directly to that. And I'm going to ha have a, a way to navigate there uh, quickly. So that's a very, a very useful um, functionality as well. You can enter data, uh, geographic data on the web as well, um, but it's not using the GPS at this point. Um, that is something I think we could add if the, if that's available. A lot of laptops, as I mentioned, do not have a GPS, so it, it's not as useful as on the mobile device. Um, but that is a way to, to enter uh, event data uh, or coordinate data. For org units, I think it'd be, it'd be worth having a little bit of a discussion uh, with the group here about ways that you've addressed challenges in boundary uh, geometries or facility locations in in your countries, because that is kind of fundamental to being able to use maps effectively is you need you need reliable and up to date information on where things actually are. So uh, just to start off as a show of hands, who has had any challenges with having up to date facility locations or district boundaries in your countries? We have two, no one else. Wow, impressive. Okay, three, great. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Do you have Do you have any insight into how how you've addressed that, or how you think it could be addressed? Um, a lot of times it's political, but sometimes it's also uh, technical uh, in terms of how how do you keep an up to date registry, make sure that it's synchronized between all the systems that are involved. Uh, any anyone have insight into that? I don't know if we have a microphone. Sure, uh, do you have a mic? Yeah, I don't know if, you, yeah, Adnan, do you want to start? Thank you. Um, well, uh, we do have this um, uh, agency in Pakistan that, uh, you know, is, uh, is, uh, presents maps every year or every other year, whenever you change, uh, the district boundaries are changed. I mean, if you just take an example of Balochistan, there have been many uh, changes in the districts. Uh, yeah. Some districts have been merged. Some districts have been uh, converted into two different districts. So, yeah. so th uh, this is one of the things that uh, we can get mapping from there because doing it manually, uh, it's it's challenging because yeah. it's uh, we we cannot uh, you know see properly the boundaries and everything. Yeah. So the best way is to just get the map from the government. Um, as Adnan mentioned, like uh, about Pakistan, same situation we are fa facing in IDSR as well. So uh, what we are doing is like we are in contact with Survey of Pakistan. They have uh, like up to date shape files. So um, that's it. But yeah, we are in contact with us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, updated shape files is is definitely one thing. I think uh, you you sort of touched on it, but but merging and splitting of org units of facilities of districts is 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 complicated. 
um, not just for the maps. I mean, that's that's one thing, right? Obviously, you need to update the the geometries and the locations, but also the data. Like, how, what do you do with the data? Um, that's actually something I, I demoed uh, briefly on the uh, um, on Wednesday as well. A, a feature that's coming soon is the ability to to merge uh, organization units. It's supported in the API right now um, with only two merge styles formats. Um, but there's there's other complexities that you need to take into account, and and obviously it's it's helpful to have a an interface for that as well. Um, but that's yeah, that's definitely a a challenge that that we see quite a bit. Anyone else want to add on? Yes. Yeah, these are the uh, real challenge in our country, uh, specifically in hard to reach areas, uh, the hill track districts. Yeah. And uh, malaria is also endemic in that area. Yeah. So our plan is like that. Uh, we need to do the micro stratification at the village level, yeah. but the uh, the geolocation is uh, available only up to the sub district level. Uh -huh. So uh, that was the challenges faced during uh, mapping of uh, of sub districts and also at the village level. Yeah. So what we did, we did it physically visiting the areas. Hmm. And uh, and in that way, we are we are trying to uh, finish the uh, mapping of all the uh, uh, sub districts in 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 hill track districts. Yeah. But but this is really a challenge. Yes. Yeah. Very much a challenge. And I don't know that there is one answer. <laughs> Probably many many things that we can do, but it's 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 a challenge for sure. Um. Okay. I wanted to share a little bit. Uh, does anyone else want to want to comment on that topic? Or, or discuss ideas. Crazy ideas are very welcome here. It's a safe space. Um, I did want to share also some, we talked a lot about the Google Earth Engine support here. Um, so I wanted to, to demonstrate that quickly. I'm gonna change this back so that I can see it on my screen because it's very difficult to do down there. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Google Earth Engine um, capabilities that we have in DHS2. As you can see, we have many different layers here. Population building footprints is a relatively new one, but that's quite useful. So let's say, let's let's do a, a building footprint layer. Um, let's go ahead and add this layer here. Takes a minute because it, uh, it is actually going to, to Google to calculate the, um, the building footprints and then get those back and hopefully it will finish here quickly. So this is loading uh, basically the satellite determined uh, all, all of the buildings, all of the structures in this, the country of Sierra Leone. So if we, if we start, I'm not gonna, not gonna need to dive in there too much, but if we start to zoom in here, and we get closer, we'll see that we get more and more detail. This is a city, obviously, so there's a lot of buildings there. But let's try a, a more rural area, maybe this here. And I think this is quite an interesting um, uh, layer and, and use, very useful in uh, spraying campaigns, for example, but many other use cases as well, to be able to determine, I mean, this is obviously a town with a number of buildings, you can see exactly where those buildings are. Um, you can actually use this on the um, to, to, to plan a campaign of, of spraying. You can use this to determine where populations might be that you might be underserved by your health system. Um, so that's a very useful functionality. We can also add, let's say, population uh, by age group. So as we mentioned, we can uh, split this up. So let's say we want males and females under under five years old, let's see all three of these, uh, no, both of those. So let's just say one to years one to four. So we have both males and females under four or under five. And we're gonna load this layer as well. So this is a, an interesting um, uh, use case because you can actually see the two different layers, two different colors here. So we have the building footprints, but we also have estimates in those 100 meter by 100 meter grids of, let's go to this uh, same place again, of the the population and how it is 
uh, how many people are estimated to be living in that little village um, who are under five years old? And so we can actually see that in this in this specific point. Um, sorry, this is a yeah, this is this is the the entire region because we aggregate by the region. We can choose how we want to do that, but we can actually see um, show the population age groups just in this uh, hectare or hundred meter by hundred meter square, and we can see that the the estimate here is that there are eight people in the hundred meter by hundred meter square who are under the age of five. So there, there's maybe one or two families that are living there. Um, so this is really useful also, and we can go back to the example maps that we had here um, to show another example from uh, South Africa. And this one was actually where they used the population layer and the building footprints layer as well to identify rural populations that had no access to health facilities that they didn't even know existed. So they, they, they were not registered at all in the, in, the, in, in the system because it's a very, very remote location. So they were able to use this building footprint layer, this uh, population layer from Google Earth Engine uh, fed by WorldPop to find people with no services at all uh, and then can do an outreach campaign to that, to that community specifically. Um, so this is a really interesting use of just just being able to kind of put this data on a map and and explore it. As we did just there, we dove into a specific um, a specific village, and we could learn a lot about that village just by turning on two layers that were very easy to to configure. Um, there were some other examples of that as well um, in this in this workshop. Um, so there's a lot of a uh, lot of useful examples here. Let's go ahead and actually let's do that one. Um, I don't know if this is an interesting exercise, so please stop me if it's not. Um, but can someone uh, volunteer maybe to interpret this map for us? Say what what story is it telling us, and and why is it why is it important? Why is it useful? Any volunteers? Maybe people don't like this exercise. That's okay. No volunteers? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So uh, it's uh, basically uh, showing uh, uh, red in uh, population, uh, red color basically uh, is showing population and uh, the confirmed cases of uh, uh, TB. Uh, uh, it's uh, actually showing the, the higher, uh, where the population is higher, the, the cases of uh, TB are uh, also uh, but in some areas, uh, there maybe the population is low. That's why the cases are uh, maybe zero or uh, low. Yeah. So this is. Yeah, it seems that way. Um, it it looks like there's some interesting case down here where we have relatively higher uh, yeah, density of population, yeah. but no, but not as many cases of TB. Yeah. So that's maybe maybe those are in a different. Uh, maybe those are not served by a health facility. Maybe that's undiagnosed TB potentially. Um, there could be a lot of things to investigate with, with just looking at this map. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to, to look at visualizations like this and, and start to see what, uh, what you might, uh, yeah, what you could learn from something like this. But, but also it does not say why in some areas, the number of cases are high. Yeah. It, it's it, difficult to, uh, uh, say from the, seeing this, this map. Yes. Yeah, yeah. In that uh, you, case, we need to go to the data and yeah. So, but it, it gives you a, a place to look. So you need to. This is where you need, you could start looking at. There's a, a high population and a high case of TB here. What we we could investigate that in the data. Maybe the data doesn't tell you what it is. So you need to go and actually visit the facility and and do some investigation. Um. So yeah, it's it it doesn't tell the whole story. And I think that's that's almost all data will will not tell you the whole story. Um. And so you need to use it as as kind of the uh, a way to spark curiosity and figure out figure out what's actually going on but very good point uh, let's let's do one more yeah for the countries uh, like like south africa which is a high burden for tb as well as high burden for hiv yes i think we should triangulate the HIV-TB cases 
I mean, uh, not uh, TB case notification against the HIV notification in the same district, huh. so that we may, may be able to know that there could be a comorbid cases there yeah. instead of TB alone. Yeah. So perhaps uh, we should take lot many epidemiological assumptions while plotting the the maps. Not only this only shows the notification details. Yes. Uh, it doesn't show anything else which might, uh, uh, I mean, any confounder, which is basically affecting the notification here. Yeah. So it is a simple correlation that the population is high, so the notification is high, but we need to know something more about that. Yeah. Thank you. It'd be interesting to know also if there were uh, higher numbers of suspected cases in some places than, than in others. Um, and comorbidity is a very, very important one. Uh, again, you need to fi find some way to visualize that on a map or to, to, to explore it in another way. Very good point. Uh, last one. And again, I, I haven't seen these before uh, other than at a glance. So I'm, I'm interpreting them with you. <laughs> uh, this one, the legend is a little bit... So this is actually a, a good example of maybe um, what does 100 to 250 coverage mean? I'm not sure in this case. So we, so we have 200% coverage in some cases, um, which I, feels like maybe that's an indication of something that, that is not, not going right or in the data collection. Uh, probably your denominator is not, not correct. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting case where uh, again accurate population data uh, we had somebody mention that uh, if you have a census from 2004 population has grown a lot since 2004 and if you're using that as the basis for your denominator for uh, uh, immunization coverage you're going to have great immunization coverage but it's not actually going to be covering people <laughs> it's going to be covering the 2004 population and so i think there's yeah there's uh, that's another big challenge in addition to the location of facilities making sure that's up to date is having accurate denominators and this is this is something that it's a, a big problem. I, I wish um, maybe Jorn or, or Ula were here to talk a little bit about this as well. Um, but the the denominator problem is a big one. Um, and it's also a challenge sometimes politically because the the person at the facility level, they just want to know how many people are in, in, or, or in their district. They want to know that so that they can provide coverage. But sometimes the political motivation is, is to uh, present a number that looks good. And that can be a, a conflicting interest. So it, what's what's interesting about DHS too is that you can have both, right? You can have the um, the the official census numbers, for example, and you can have more nuanced, uh, detailed uh, estimates at the at the facility level, so that people can try to find the people that are un, unreached, for example. Um, but that's a big it's a big challenge in a lot of places. Any any other anyone else want to interpret or, or uh, comment on on this map here? What what it might say? No. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I think the map uh, actually shows the MRI coverage, uh, MR one coverage. Sorry, and uh, similar to this, uh, we also experienced this uh, the coverage going more than hundred percent. Yeah. So uh, it typically, for me, I think uh, it typically depends on why you are plotting that map, yeah. uh, the typical use cases, uh, the purpose of the map. Uh, for example, in my context, uh, I wanted to see the coverage as well as the use of uh, the vaccine doses. Yeah. So uh, in that, uh, for the overall na na national or uh, at the district level, it will be 100%. But at the sub-district level, it will go more than 100% because uh, District A, the catchment population of the District A can receive vaccine from District B. So yeah. uh, it makes uh, sense uh, in that way. So it's I think uh, it also depends on how you interpret uh, the data and uh, where and the purpose that uh, you plot that map. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Any other any other comments thoughts on this on this particular map? We can move on to one more.
So this is two different maps, obviously, but it's telling you it's telling you an interesting an interesting story as well, I think. Anybody want to venture a guess as to why why it's why it's interesting to have both of these next to each other? So if you show if you show someone this map just on the left, what are they going to assume? The entire south of the country is bad, right? That the that that's a lot. That's a big area that needs to be like completely overhauled with their health system in order to address this. But if you go a little bit deeper and you 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 zoom into the the next level, you'll see that it's it's not the whole south. Like there's there's very good coverage actually in some of those districts, um, but you you need to go a little bit deeper and and find uh, the next level of that data. So it's it's important. This is a good example of kind of the map tells a story, but it can tell the wrong story very easily, right? So it's it's if you show someone this map, they will they will have a very different uh, assumption than if you show them this map, which gives a more detailed uh, uh, action plan for how to how to actually address this problem by maybe going to the east or the west instead of to the south of this country. Any other comments or thoughts on this one? Any, any has anyone ever seen a map that was misleading before? I have <laughs> many times. I think that's that's a very interesting uh, point as well. Is is it's uh, it can tell a story, and and sometimes it can tell the wrong story, and and uh, it's important to to think about what what story you want to tell, uh, <laughs> and how to make it actually actionable and useful. This one is a little bit busy. But can we, yeah, can someone venture a guess as to what story this might be telling? Thank you. Uh, issuing a painter one number of values on the legend, if we can see, and uh, uh, it also shows, it shows the river, roads, and the health facilities, and also it is showing the population as well. So the color intensity is showing the uh, you know the painter one number value where it is high, and clearly as I mentioned before, we can see the river side. You know we can see the roads and health facilities and number of and density of population on the map as well, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, the last one, which is showing the area in kilometers. Sure. So, yeah, does anyone, does anyone have a, um, uh, and uh, that, that, that's, that's correct. That's all correct. But what, what story is it telling? What, what do we notice? I mean, there, there are many things we could notice. Um, uh, yeah. I think uh, uh, there's a, a lot of population, but uh, they don't have roads to access uh, the health facilities. That's why uh, in this part, uh, they don't have uh, so, so much uh, good uh, uh, vaccination, I can say. Yeah, I think that's a good a good observation. So we have we have a lot of black dots here. Black dots is population. Uh, a lot of black dots that are not covered. So I think these these circles, it's not it's not labeled here. But I think these are one kilometer circles around the facility. Uh, so, so the the white circles I think are, uh, yeah. So you have basically I think it, it's a catchment population of yeah. Uh, facilities. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of people that are living more than five kilometers. I think it's five or ten, maybe ten kilometers from a health facility. Uh, they and there's no even have a health facilities in this in their areas. Exactly. Um, and then you have poor uh, vaccination coverage and that that could be a cause for that and it could be something to you could address to try to uh, address the the poor coverage okay i think that's it we have about 15 minutes left um just want to turn it over to all of you to ask any questions that you have or anything further that you'd like to discuss um about maps about gis about dhs2 in general about uh how to implement uh, programs in your countries using mapping data. 
Um, this is the same uh, um, quiz as before, so you, you don't need to. Uh, you can fill it out if you if you haven't filled it out already. It's very helpful. But does anyone have any questions or or thing that something that came to mind that they would like to discuss? Sure. Uh, can you please explain the land cover uh, layer? Sure. So the to to explain land cover, um, I'm going to I'm going to add this layer, and I'll actually get rid of these other two. And let's let's keep let's leave let's leave building footprints actually I think that's a good one. Let's put that one on top. Um, so as you can see here on the, in the on the left side, I'll zoom in a little bit. As you can see here on the left side, we have different types of land coverage, right? So this is using satellite data to estimate what what that land is used for. So is it cropland? Is it forest? Is it urban development? Is it, um, what type of forest is it? Is it a grassland? Is it snow? There's, there's lots, of, lots of options there. Um, is it water? Of course. Um, so we can start here on the, on, the, on the border and we can see what this, what this looks like, right? So we have some, some islands that, have, uh, uh, that are not really islands. It looks like they're wetland. So this is a, the wetland color, which means that it's probably like a marsh or some kind. Um, we, we can go a little bit further in. We see we have some more um, like grassland, savanna, a little bit of wooded area. Um, we might have uh, some cropland somewhere around here. Let's see if we can find some. Yeah, so this is a cropland slash uh, natural vegetation mosaic. Um, we can see maybe where we have a little bit more grassland. We can definitely see where we have um, uh, more urban uh, environment. So if we look at urban, we have that where we see urban. Urban is red. So we can see here we have a, a city, for example. And so this is urban development. It looks like it's surrounded by uh, um, cropland or maybe a, maybe a forest. I need to look into that a little bit more. And you can actually look at this closely and, and say, just in this point, this is cropland natural vegetation mosaic. So this, this can be useful for a number of different reasons. I mean, it can be helpful for, for targeting outreach. It can be helpful if you're doing um, investigation into uh, standing water for malaria, into water areas for, uh, for a potential flood risk. Probably wetlands are, are particularly uh, relevant there, but also maybe um uh yeah different types of of investigation um it can be become very valuable in a in a number of other cases when you're trying to to figure out the intersection of health and climate health and environment um one health those types of things um does that explain answer your question of what it what it does there's a lot more that you could do with that that I'm I'm no expert on, but there's a lot of interesting um, use cases I think for uh, having having this information available. Any other questions on this layer type? Okay. Any other questions about yeah? Uh, just. Uh... Two quick questions. Uh, number one, uh, I think uh, for my uh, organization, we were not able to use uh, really use DHIS to map uh, is because of the legend, yeah. uh, the legend. interval of the legend. Yeah. So uh, it auto generates based on the number of uh, the intervals, uh, the categories that we require, for example. Uh, and uh, is there a way to customize it uh, and then uh, specify the intervals or the bin? Uh, the number two is a uh, few uh, notes on uh, how to subscribe uh, for the satellite and the uh, yeah um good question so the first one uh, I, I are you talking about a um a, like a thematic or chloroplast layer there? yes yeah yes. 
so in, in this example, we have a chloroplast layer for ANC coverage um, that I'm going to add. Uh, in the style tab, you can use either an automatic color legend or a predefined color legend. For automatic, you can specify either equal intervals or equal counts. So this means like if you have one, two, three, four, or five, you can either say, uh, well, one to 10, then you can either say one and two, or you can say like the first 10, the second 10, the third 10, uh, different ways to, to, to split that up. You can have up to nine classes that are automatically generated. So let's say we wanted nine different levels of gradation. And then this will, um, because we're doing equal interval here, you'll see it automatically picks the, um, the minimum value, the maximum value, and then splits that up uh, by uh, about 10, 10.5. 10.4. Um, so each of these is about 10.4 wide um, in terms of value. If we chose instead equal counts, it would do it um, based on the, the actual values that are in there and say that uh, we're splitting this up evenly based on kind of how the, the data is distributed. So we have roughly one, it can't do exactly, but one or two um, count uh, values in each of these uh, locations. Um, you can also do, uh, as I show here, you can also uh, specify a, a predefined legend. So this one is ANC coverage, um, which is defined specifically for ANC. You can do that. Um, that is defined in the maintenance application. Uh, and there you can ha you have a bit more flexibility in defining exactly what the, that legend can show. Might take a moment. So we have legend here. So have this ANC coverage legend. And there you can define exactly what the start value is, what the end value is, uh, what the color is, and what the name, to, to the label is for each of the values in your legend. And so you can actually define a custom legend um, as you'd like. Does that answer your question about legends? Yes, thank you, thank you. Great. And then you, you your second question was about how do you sign up for um, uh, Google Earth Engine or, or get access to that. Um, that is just here. Let's go back to this one here. It should be, yep, there we go. So as uh, we'll we'll share this as well, but you can search on, on docs.dhs2.org. Um, there's documentation there to show you exactly how to access that Google Earth Engine layer. Uh, Basically, just send an email to maps at dhs2.org, and we'll get you signed up. So we, we it used to be uh, every country had to had to talk with Google, and then they would get have to validate with us that it was using DHS2 and was an actual country. But basically, you just uh, can send us a, a, an email. We can generate you a key, and and you can go from there. So that's that's <laughs> that's as 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 basically as simple as it can get. And uh, there's some additional instructions that you need to, to actually install the key in your system. So you have to put it on your file system and, and start DHS2, um, point to it in your DHS comp file. Um, but it's, it's as simple as that to, to get signed up. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? We have a few minutes left and then we'll wrap up. I know people are getting towards the end of the last day. <laughs> Oh no, it's okay. Any other questions, thoughts, comments, jokes? Do they have a joke? All right. With that, I think I will wrap up maybe a few minutes early. I don't know, Shirji, if you had anything you wanted to talk about or add or yeah. no? Okay. Thank you all very much for your time. Hopefully it was a good session. Thank you. And I, I did very little talking, I'm, I'm uh, happy to say. So I'm glad that we had the, uh, a discussion and thank you all for sharing because um, that's, that's really what this is about. So thank you very much.
Right. Uh, so we are waiting for the uh, the session downstairs to finish, and uh, they all join us join us for the closing ceremony. But until we get started, uh, those of uh, again related to the last amount uh, an announcement I did. So those of you who are sponsored uh, from the Hispatia Hub, you can collect your visa fee from the registration desk. So please, those of you who are sponsored from the Hispatia Hub, your visa fee can be collected from the front desk. And also please mind, uh, please note that uh, the visa fee will be paid in Sri Lankan rupees because in Sri Lanka, we are not supposed to uh, hand over any cash other than Sri Lankan rupees. So unfortunately, we are not able to uh, give you uh, money in US dollars. So you can get it changed at the airport. Uh, as an entity, we are not allowed to uh, disburse any USD payments in Sri Lanka. That's why. Thank you.